let me hear and see what you've noted and started acting upon from the last class you had on Wednesday. Yes, who's going to go first? <clears throat> All right, Theophilus, great. Let's hear from you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, now, in our last lesson, I, one of the lessons that I pick from the business case presentation is that you must be able to uh, precise and also to be able to coordinate yourself. And uh, in your presentation, you should be able to be accurate in your presentation. And also your uh, presentation must be accurate. Okay. And uh, right. yes, sir, must be accurate yes. and, and be able to be confident of what you are presenting to the presenters. Okay, super. And uh, also, uh, you must not your you must be called you must be coordinated. So and uh, also your your written doc uh, your presentation must not be uh, such that uh, they will not be able to the uh, the the people that are presenting it to not, should be able to be readable of what you have written or presenting. Okay. So these are the same of the thing that I like this. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Phyllis. Adela, please go ahead. Okay, good evening, sir. Good evening, class. Um, my takeaway from last class was um, uh, whatever you are proposing must be tied to a business um, driver. What what you has to be tried to a business driver, and it must um, you must align with the with the um, corporate goals of the organization, Super. whatever it is you're proposing. Super. Um, Thank you. Also, the bed bedrock of your approval will lie on your analysis and the leadership, how you drive that analysis to a sellable conclusion. So um, fantastic. Those were my takeaways. In the last class, thank you. Thank you, excellent, excellent, well done. All right, so who's coming next to give you feedback from the last class? Yes, go on guys, you are all here. Go ahead and tell me your takeaways. If you don't have a takeaway, you're not acting on anything from that class, you wasted my time and your money. Mm -hmm. So please say it, let me know exactly what you are doing out of the whole lesson of that day. <clears throat> Who's going next? All right, Tony, please go ahead. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, um... Class, uh, what my colleagues have summarized as much as possible. So you don't tell too much stories um, when you are making your presentation. Mm -hmm. So your audience don't lose track of what you are trying to mm -hmm. get them to understand. Okay, super. Thank you, Kinsley. Kinsley, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening, welcome. Yeah, yeah. my background is a little bit noisy. I'm in a translator. My takeaway for the last uh, section was uh, when, present, when, when presenting a business case, you should you must be specific and um, know your audience, know the people you are doing, know their business and all that. And uh, you should also. Uh, I, I just went over. You should also know the time when you are to present your 
mm -hmm. presentation. Know the time that is best to, to bring out, to, to, to give out your presentation. Not okay. when people are lousy or anything, not even willing to hear you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I think that is my last, my okay. takeaway for the last session. All right, that's fantastic. All right, Leighton, please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Class. Yeah. Uh, actually, my takeaway from the yesterday, uh, the, the last class, mm -hmm. uh, I in doing your presentation, understand that you need to know your friends, you need to know your enemies, you need to know people yeah. that can support your presentation, and also people that can be against you. If possible, you can meet them prior to the presentation. Super. In fact, you should meet them prior to the presentation. You should find a way to engage them informally before you uh, meet them formally so that they don't um, shoot you down. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Samuel. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, so um what I get to learn or take home from the last class was every proposal, the primary aim for every proposal is to get approval. Yeah. So certainly you must know you must visit like okay know your supporters people that you know they might go against you you have to go and meet them first explain to them let them know what exactly you are trying to propose hear their own view and know how to go about it so that when you are proposing you won't get turned down by those ones so meeting them first would make them aware about they will have been aware that okay you are proposing this and they must have admit to what you propose to them at first and take and give you some corrections or how to go about it instead of proposing directly and they will now get you toned down. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Fantastic, everybody. Um, when reviewing these lessons, try and think back to the FM um, strategic planning class that we did so that you can piece the two together if you understand, if you. If you don't understand the organization deep enough, at a strategic level enough, nothing you do as a facility manager at the tactical and the operational level will show alignment. Nothing you do at that level will be customized for the organization. And that's why most FM departments have issues with their organizations. You are trying to use a, a blanket template from one organization to another without customizing the solutions to meet the needs of the organization. That's where that alignment takes place. You must understand a uh, very high level um, strategic goals of the organization before everything you do at the lower levels will make sense. Yes, Daniel, please go ahead. Yes, good evening, sir. Good evening. It defines your confidence. People are able to gain through your work or whatever you are saying, through your body language and use of work. So that is very, very paramount when sure. presenting. Very good. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, well done, everybody. I'm going to go straight into today's lesson. Today's lesson, every time I, 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 I come to class, I'll say today's lesson is one of the most important lessons you will ever learn, right? Um, but the truth is, virtually every lesson is so, so important in this program. And today, we're going to be learning some life lessons, things that will apply to your career, to your growth, but again, or more importantly, to your life as a whole, your progress in life, in marriage, in everything you do, just some um, soft skills that can take you far. Um, it's what we'll be covering in today's workplace productivity skills training. So I'm going to share my screen.
Okay. I hope my screen is up. You seeing it? Yes, sir. All right, great, great. Um, yes, we are good to go. So today, you know, uh, before today's class, let me give you a little flashback. When we started the program in the second class or third class, we looked at FM careers and we tried to put you at the end from the beginning. If I finish this program, which direction would my career need to go? And what options are there for me? Uh, what choices are there for me, right? So that's, that's we, we put that up front so that you don't start seeing interviews and saying, I'm not ready for work yet, I'm still in school. No, you have to have an idea of the kind of jobs you're looking for. So you can start, you know, modeling your career and writing your CVs to, um, you know, to align with that, that uh, plan or expectation. In today's class, we are going to put very practical bites to all of that. We're going to uh, start you off from how to arrange yourself, package yourself, CV, yourself, presentation of yourself uh, uh, for a job. How do you prepare yourself for finding a job? Then when you do find a job, how do you keep, there are two different things. People, people can be very good at finding jobs. There are those who, um, within a month or two of being out of work, boom, they're placed. But less than a year, puff, they're out. Whether it's their own doing or the doing of whatever circumstances they see, the thing they keep seeing around themselves, you can have control of the entire process from how you acquire the job to how you keep the job. And then um, in our last class, we talked about a key soft skill you need to be able to excel at your work, right? So we talked about business cases, making sense, using logic, and then presentations where you communicate and convince for approvals and the rest. In the second part of today's uh, lesson, we're going to go into the writing components of that soft skills. Um, so you, you cannot uh, say, well, uh, I'm not very good at writing. I'm not very good at English. Therefore, um, ignore all my, all my stuff and focus on, 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 on the practicality of what I'm doing. You need both. You must be able to uh, write. You must be able to manage meetings. You, know, you must be able to uh, manage a corporate uh, work environment. So that's what we're going to be doing in today's class. Okay? Quite a few models. But let's start from the first point. How do you start to look for a job? How do you start that process? Um, I know that uh, the first thing that many of us will think about, uh, about uh, finding a job is uh, to document ourselves. Put down who we are. Put down um, what we are looking for down what we have to offer um, and a few proof of our abilities. That's what a CV does. So a CV or resume is a document that, um, that you put together to describe yourself. So it's your, it's your shop front, it's your display page, right? Uh, but then after preparing that, you now go out. Networking, uh, job boards, professional associations, just basically all the outings that need to be done. My key lesson for anybody who is in between jobs or who is searching actively for work and not having, is not currently employed, is to take job searching and job, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 that recruitment process as a full-time job. If you take it as a, as a hobby or part-time work, uh, then you are going to struggle because that's just the truth. You have to take it as a full-time work um, so that the right efforts, the right efforts need to be applied to that process. But we're going to make it simpler and easier as we go through this class because we're going to really, really simplify the process for you so that you can use certain tools, certain uh, tricks, certain shortcuts to, to bypass um, a lot of um, the 
heavy lifting that goes into the uh, job uh, search and, and placement uh, um, uh, process. Now, the first thing I want to teach as a concept in workplace productivity in, in this job finding uh, section is what we call an elevator pitch or a short introductory statement of who you are. So the tool is called me in 30 seconds. If you had the chance to meet with someone you've always dreamed of working for, working with, or even getting to know, because you know this person can help you get fantastic placements. You only have a very short span of time. One, because you don't control the other person's uh, uh, priorities and time. And two, because attention span is ever getting lower. If you start a long story with an introduction, a main body of the, of the message and a conclusion or recommendation, you probably would have lost that person. What will you do in 30 seconds to show who you are, to tell who you are, to tell what you have to offer? Now, this me in 30 seconds, it's not only for verbal introductions. You put together a CV and you want to introduce yourself in the CV. So you have that um, profile summary, which is at the top, just under your name in a CV. Use this me in 30 seconds, okay? You have some job applications where they expect you to write a cover letter. That cover letter is actually asking you to use a me in 30 seconds. So this tool is made up of five parts. Introduce your name, the job you want, which is your objective for making this pitch, for sending this cover letter or CV, for having this engagement in the first place. Uh, why you would be good. And, and then something again um, that I've not mentioned, you can also use this for that moment when you're asked to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself when interviews are starting. As people will go into how I'm um, the first child in a family of six and so on and so forth. That's, you know, blood dash. Nobody cares about those. If you want to look at those, you can uh, look at your bio for that. The reality is they need you to use a big statement that introduces you and tells them something significant related to why you are even there in the first place. So say your name, your objective, why you will be good at it. So that's the next thing, your qualifications. Some traits or skills that will help you succeed in that job. These are like um, uh, evidences, proof that you have what it takes. And then finally, a commitment question. So let's start with your name. Why should you start with your name? And I've heard people say, my name is Samuel. My name is Paul. My name is Sarah. Why do you introduce yourself with a single name? What is so terrible with your second surname? Why, why, why is it? Is it out of convenience? Is it out of, um, is it a secret? You know, it's too often. Somebody will call me on the phone and say, oh, my name is John. Uh, I was asked to meet you. John what? Okay, let me see if I can make some of you who have stable internet uh, co-hosts so you can admit your colleagues. It looks like the co-hosts from the training department, they are dropping off. And so some of you are staying a little bit longer in the waiting room, which is not right. So let's see, uh, who has a stable internet who can make an offer? for me to make you co-host so you can admit others. Nobody? <laughs> Just say I have stable internet, I can admit others. I'm not dropping off and in. And is anybody that has not dropped off since we started has a stable internet? 
Uh, there are two hands up there. I do. Let, let me see, okay. Yes, okay, so let me make, uh, there can be a co-host and also uh, Sama. Okay, fantastic. All right, thank you. So please admit your colleagues when they do comment so that uh, they will not be left in the waiting room. All right. So me in 30 seconds has five components. The first one is say your name. My name is, but please, my name is not a single name. Nobody identifies by a single name. Samuel represents some millions of people in the world, right? So why would you just say my name is Samuel? You're not saying anything. It, it, it actually says something about how enlightened you are, uh, how uh, unenlightened, if I would uh, be more precise, to say my name is Samuel, my name is Paul, my name is John, my name is Sarah. You need to say your not all of your names, at least first name and surname, right? So I have multiple names, but at least my first name and surname identifies me for this purpose and for virtually every purpose. We teach kids to say their full names and then we ourselves as adults introduce ourselves as you know Mary and the rest, wrong. Number two, state your objective. Don't ever forget why you are having any engagement. There's something in your mind that you need to express. And there's a reason you are making that expression. State it. In this case, in me, for me in 30 seconds, it is the objective of the job you want. And I want a job as in so if you, can, if you can be specific on the kind of job you are looking for and the industry or category or segment of that job, because if I want a job as, a, as an accountant, I don't want it in any organization in any industry. An accountant in a, a, a technology firm, an accountant in a, a fast moving goods, company are two different domains. So even if I want to job as a facility manager, I need to know the specific industry that I, I want that job in. So um, state your objective and please be specific on the two dimensions of this objective. A job type and a domain or segment where that job should be, should be. And of course, because you are doing this to someone or an organization, you can be that specific, not just an industry. I can say, I want a job as a facility manager in church gate group. I'm bringing the organization uh, to spotlight, to focus because I am teaching before that organization. Why you will be good at that job? What qualifies you for this job? Do you have any reason why you are even going to be considered? Why should I consider you? You know, if I can drop this in quickly, I will look like a beggar. If I just tell my name and say, I want this and that's it, right? No, I don't want to look like a beggar. I'm trying to tell you that I'm good at what I do. I must state it quickly. And I must prove it using number four, some traits or skills that will help you succeed in that job. So these are the things that I'm going to say, look, you know what? I said I can do this, but these are the things that I can tell you to let you know that I can really do it. And then don't leave without shooting your shots. A commitment question. All of that one to four are useless if you don't have a commitment question. In marketing, we say it's a call to action. A call to action is a drive home, making specific requests if, of what you want. There are so many people that have not been used to talking in this way. You can talk and talk and talk and talk and the person you are talking to just simply says, okay, I've heard you. If you come back tomorrow and say, 
That's what we said yesterday. Um, you said you've heard me, but you've not done anything. He will not ask you, what do you expect me to do? Because you think by telling the story, I should go and ask. No, if you don't ask specifically, you have not asked. I don't know whether your story, what, whatever you really want to get from me for telling me that story. Okay, it's called a me in 30 seconds. You need to create several versions of it and internalize it. Now, you may think that this tool is just for finding jobs. It's not. It can help you pass through appraisals and, and get promotions. It can help you pass through major presentations, you know, to groups or management uh, at, at different um, uh, times. And so you modify it to suit the need. Whenever you have to introduce yourself at all, it has to be using a mean 30 seconds. This is an example. Hello, my name is AK Sonia, and I want a job as site facility manager in a mall. Watch the first two. Number one, the name came out. Two names. And then number two, the objective came out in two segments, designation or type of work and specific domain segment or industry. I have three years of site operations experience and a comprehensive FM training. What am I doing here? What, what are my qualifications? And again, qualifications, I've used two legs. One is my experience in site operations, specifically mentioning how many years and the other is my qualification with regards to education or training and a comprehensive FM training. If you, if you create your mean 30 seconds and you can fit in uh, uh, that statement that shows where you got your training or what qualification of training you've gotten, that would be fantastic. A comprehensive uh, diploma in facility management from Max Bigo Training Center. You know, but make sure that whatever you put into this, your introduction has to be a 30 second introduction. So you rehearse it, you know, calmly and, and the way you say something casually to make sure it doesn't exceed that 30 seconds. So that's number three in this example. And what happens next? I'm going to talk about some traits or skills that will help me succeed in the job I'm looking for. My clients always rate me high on customer service. Wow, okay. I'm a process-driven FM and my team give me their best efforts. I've just pieced together three traits or skills. My customer service, top-notch. I deliver using processes, fantastic. And I have team management abilities. I have leadership skills to get my team to give their best effort. I've just fulfilled number four in me in 30 seconds. And what's the last thing I need to do? My commitment question. What position would you need my skills and experience for? Something specific. You can create multiple versions of this depending on the circumstances you find yourself. But do not allow this mean 30 seconds end without a specific commitment question. A call to action draws or elicits a feedback. And in many cases, decisions can be taken at that moment to either see you again, ask for your CV, uh, uh, send you a link to apply for something. Something will most likely happen from this discussion because you have just elicited an instant feedback with a question, which is a commitment question. Tool number two, the power statements. Where do you use power statements? You know, when I was teaching the, I was teaching the class here when I said, uh, many of you have CV that outlines all the things you've been assigned to do. And I said, such CVs go into the bin. Nobody wants to know what you've been assigned to do. 
Your CVs are supposed to show achievements, accomplishments. What value have you added? That's the only thing that matters. Everything else is secondary. Okay? Now, to the specific, most direct application of the power statement. You see that part of the CV where you want to impress by lifting out all your skills. Oh, um, I have um, uh, 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 customer service. I have uh, uh, high attention to details. I, I work under pressure. <laughs> I, I, I have high integrity, blah, blah, blah. We write all of those things. And you just write it there and you leave it there. My dear, please stop writing those things in your CVs if you are not ready to prove them. Instead of writing 10 skills, write two or three skills using the power statements because those are the two or three skills that the job requires. Nobody wants to know whether you are a good musician, you can play uh, 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 whatever notation and whatever uh, 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 keys or whatever. Nobody, it doesn't matter if I'm looking for an FM, right? Uh, nobody needs to know all the other plenty skills you have in multiple areas. Oh, you know Java, you know this, you know that. You can code and you're applying for an FM job. Is it relevant to the job? Because we are going to get to the point where we need to keep our CVs to two pages, right? And because you want to keep your CVs to two pages, well, if you are very experienced, 10 years and above, you can go up to four or five. Well, I would recommend five pages for any reason. I don't have a CV that's five pages. Uh, with all my experience, it's just four pages max, right? So uh, keep it to two pages for the first uh, 10 years of your career. And then you can increase it to three pages. And then maybe if you have too much achievements and accomplishments to show for specific jobs that you're applying for, or for specific opportunities you are trying to engage with, you can have um, uh, four pages. But again, as soon as you go past that stage, um, you go back again to a one-page profile. So if somebody asks me who I am today, I use a one-page profile to present myself, okay? Because yes, that's where I am now. But in, in line with keeping uh, to uh, a certain uh, uh, number of pages, you don't want to, uh, you know, run a lot the risk of um, not having information to flesh out the skills you are presenting as your skills, right? I don't want to have um, the risk of uh, having to defend every skill you put in there and then you have 10 pages. But this is the bottom line. Every time you write a skill, you must use a power statement. Whether it's in a cover letter, whether it's in a uh, CV, whether it's filling application forms where they ask you all those questions and you're feeling all about yourself. This is the tool for it. There are four parts to this one, not five, four. Number one, identify a value, skill, or strength. This is exactly what you are selling about yourself. Number two, give a specific example or accomplishment. How do you know you have attention to detail? Show me with a specific example. I can look at your CV if you've used the right power statement to present yourself. And I know exactly how to find out what you have done. In many cases, I just know that you know what you are doing because you have presented an example. But that's not enough. The example must also come with results. A skill is useless if it does not bring in an extra value. I need to ensure that that value um, uh, is presented, you know, along with that accomplishment or example. And then finally, I must match the values to the needs of the employer. You see this alignment we're talking about all along with this program is so key to our future and our success that you cannot play with it. You cannot have a skill that you are flaunting at me that I don't need. If you have it and you're using a past statement to present it to me and you don't align with what I am looking for, you're wasting all that effort. 
So that's why number four is so critical. Match that value of skill to the needs of the employer. An example, I'm creative and resource oriented. This is very common, isn't it? I'm creative and resource oriented. We always throw this in our CVs. But don't allow that full stop or at first or exclamation mark be the end of the sentence because that is called a cliche. Cliches are discounted. It's copy and paste. That's what it's called. Nobody takes it seriously. But then when the past statement rolls out, for example, at Max Migold, I created a new marketing plan and brochure that directly increased monthly sales by 15%. Oops. Okay. This guy knows his onions. It has a specific example that we can verify. I can call the MD of Max Migold today and say, do you know AK Sonia, who worked for you at so and so time. I'm trying to recruit and I want to find out if this person actually uh, uh, created a marketing plan and brochure that only increased monthly sales by 15%. It's so easy to, 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 to check. It has to be a real example. I'm confident I can help to improve your company sales in the same way. I'm showing alignment, value matching it to the organization. If you reduce costs, if you've created uptime, availability, uh, you've reduced uh, mean time between failure, if you've uh, 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 increased uh, traceability and accountability of energy use, if you've uh, speed, speeded up the process of uh, determining service charge and increased the revenue collection rates. And so there are so many things that you should have in your power statement. Many people just have their CVs and you just, um, as the site facility manager, I was responsible for, then the list will now continue. As the um, um, supervisor of social and so, in social and so place, I was responsible for, you now make a list. My dear, scrap all of those things. Scrap all of them. They are useless. They are not useful. Have this class been given the CV, uh, um, the CV assignment? Have we done the CV assignment in this class? I need a yes, response. Have you, you've not done the CV assignment, okay. Well, uh, it, 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 it has to be done now. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't see it as too much work when assignments are going back to back. It's, it's, it's the power of the training. You are going to write your CV again. All of you, everybody are going to rewrite their CVs and submit within the next two days. You are going to use me in 30 seconds to do your introduction. You are going to use past statements for every skill you, have, you, you, you list on your CVs. And you are going to remove all of those job responsibilities and replace them with actual job completion, accomplishments in terms of value addition and uh, 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 you know, uh, improvements. Uh, in the roles you have handled in your historical roles. So three things I'm going to look out for when I'm scoring this assignment. One, the use of past statements, the use of uh, being 30 seconds for your introduction, your, your intro summary. Two, the use of past statements for every of your skill, listing of your skill, right? And then three, your replacement of your uh, job roles with job accomplishments in the section that has your historical uh, um, uh, section where you where you put in your work history. Uh, who will volunteer to put this assignment on the chat and in the group? I need a volunteer now, please. Should I go over it again? Yes. Yes, sir. Rewrite, rewrite your CV from scratch. Apply the tool of me in 30 seconds in your summary, which is your headliner after your name. Two, use past statements for every skill 
you are trying to showcase. And three, replace your job roles with job accomplishments in your historical uh, sections. Those are the three things I would score in your CV. Taking. So who's going to volunteer to put it in the group and in the chat now? I'll put it, sir. All right. Thank you so much. All right, so let's move on. So you have your CV done. You're now ready to hit the market. Many people have been working um, in their life out of luck. They just finished school. They were talking in their living room. Somebody says, oh, they are, somebody said they're recruiting. Let me go and try. Luckily, they just selected you. I had a friend who we were growing up. I was, we just finished our secondary school um, um, uh, then, and I was apprentice in a photography studio uh, within the next step in life uh, then. Uh, and then he always comes around and hangs around. And one day he comes to me and says, Do you see that big hotel across the street there? I'm the manager then. And I say, Ah, who makes you manager? I, I mean, he was really, really uh, short and very skinny. And you even think he's a child. You even think that he's crossed 12 or 13. At the time, he was already like 16, 17. He said, I'm the manager there. Said, Who made you manager? He said, This is the vacancy. I saw the vacancy. I've been going there for an interview. He said, I went in there yesterday and I didn't even say much. The madam just liked my face and then said, You can resume at the first of next month. <laughs> I thought he was joking, but he actually resumed. And for close to two years, he was manager of that hotel. It was, yeah, such happens, right? Uh, point here is you don't need to depend on stroke of luck to get you know, through your career or get into the right job. But sometimes we are looking, all of us are looking in one source that's giving fewer jobs Whereas few people are looking in another source that's giving more jobs. What are we trying to say? Advertisements that have been published, job boards, all of those public places for looking for work, everybody are there. I mean, there was a, there was, there was a campaign once about uh, the value of LinkedIn. We create a profile on LinkedIn. We start harassing people with, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for work. Do you have any vacancy? And blah, blah, blah. People are getting these jobs. Well, people are actually getting the jobs. But it's everywhere from between 14 to 21% in terms of uh, uh, the ratio of applicants to jobs that are being found there. But you see that informal network personal contact with companies, word of mouth, referral. Somebody knew somebody who talked to somebody and they say, let me just check you out. Uh, there's always that uh, 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 familiarity around that network. People who are actually using that network to look for work are very few, 3%, 5%. But the jobs that are being found in those settings are 30 to 35%. In fact, I can tell you that uh, in the early days of starting my company, most of the people I hired are from informal networks. In some cases, the job was created around an individual. So don't discount that um, verbalizing what you do and what you are looking for from around your network. Because you could say, oh, people in my network, oh, they're they not, they not highly placed and blah, blah, blah. You might talk about it with someone who knows somebody else you don't know, who will say, oh, I think that person might be able to help. So that's the uh, lesson here uh, about using the informal network. It's, it's called the hidden job market. The potential is huge. There are, there are little competition in there 
and there's a lot of uh, uh, jobs rolling out in that um, environment. I also know another source of very good employment, and this is one source that most people in Nigeria have not explored very well, volunteering and interning. Many of us are too eager to get paid that we lose the opportunity to get the experience or the opportunity to gain the experience. By the way, experience is not about how long you have stayed on the job. Don't, don't ever go back to bed every day and say, oh, I've had one day of experience. No, that's not an experience. That's how long you have stayed on the job. Your experience is how much accomplishments, achievements, value have you added to the job? Because if you get to the end of the month as you get your paycheck, and you can say, this month I was able to reduce turnaround time from 24 hours to 18 hours. Please write it down. It should go into your CV. And that's why your CV review process should not be a once a, a once in a lifetime or whenever you need it. Some people have worked in a place for like 10 years or 15 years. And then uh, when it's a pending or actual dislocation, uh, that's when they pull out their CV. And they say the last time they edited it was before they got that last job. My dear, that is a blunder. Your CVs should be going undergoing review on a regular basis while you are actively working and not searching for work. Because that's how you can take the achievements and accomplishments and keep editing it into your CV. Because the day your CV will be needed, it should be ready immediately to go. Okay. So interning and volunteering can open up opportunities for you. But please be honest about it. I've seen too many people coming, like you know, um, um, uh, puppies with 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 orphan puppies or whatever looking like, oh, please just give me a chance. And, and then they, they just work for one month or two months. You've shown them the ropes. You've taught them some things. And, and, and I mean, they're smart. They're picking it up. And you hope that they will begin to uh, uh, learn more. And the next thing they were like, um, I'm already adding too much value for free. <laughs> you see the mindset that you are doing something and you are not getting paid for it and as such you should reduce it or stop is destructive is is self-limiting and too many people have suffered this they don't even know that they are the ones that are creating their own backwardness it gets to the point where you will not be asked to learn something new and you begin to resist new learning because that means you will not be obliged to do more, like add more value. And you're always trying to compare the value you are adding with what you are getting. The people who fly high, who excel very well, are those that take a free opportunity and internship of 50K per month, and they work as if you pay them a million naira that month. They achieve. They put in their, their all, they are creative, they're innovating, and they are getting accolades, which they are documenting. They are getting, they're making achievement, they're adding value that they are documenting. The day they step out of that free role, they could do it for a year or even longer. The day they step out of that free role and move into another environment where uh, they appreciate what they have achieved for those guys, they could be paid 10 times what they were earning before. And, and, and don't, don't feel concerned that um, I was intending for 40K, so if somebody wants to employ me for 45 or 50, don't even think about it. I've actually interviewed somebody before who was earning 40,000 Naira as a manager somewhere. And I said, you already obviously know a lot. Why are you still earning 40,000? He said, because I have not seen the, uh, the ideal job. And I said, what is that ideal job? He said, the job has to pay him 500,000 a month. He's going to move from 40,000 to 500,000 a month. I respected him. 
Why? Because he knew exactly what he was looking for. He was building the profile and the portfolio to be able to go on for it. All right, so you get into an interview and you hear all kinds of questions. You know, when the interview question starts popping left, right, and center, uh, many of us, you know, kind of fret, look for some kind of formulas, magic ones, formulas to, to answer interview questions. If your interviewers are prepared themselves, uh, then guidance on how to respond to interview questions like these we're talking about will be useful. Because if you throw questions in an interview, they don't even know what kind of answer they should expect um, from you. And as such, whatever you say might tick them off or might you know support your uh, improve your 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 I give you an, a bit positive impression about you uh, for such people. But come on, questions. Tell me about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Why do you want to work for us? What do you think of your last boss? How do you react to pressure? What do you expect to be paid? Uh, describe the last major mistake you made and rather these are, these are pretty standard textbook uh, interview templates, right? You will meet them in most interviews, most interviews, the common question. And they're also the questions that carry the highest weight because they are not testing your technical ability. These are not questions that are testing your technical ability. They are testing your attitude and your, and your mindset. You know that your ability to do the job, your, 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 um, what will I use now? Your, your technical capability can be trained. So it's not so it's not so critical for most employers to have someone who is you know is the best with the day to day activity. They are more concerned with your attitude, character. So that's why we say uh, you, you you can you can you, you can take someone with a low aptitude. But you can't touch anybody with a low attitude because aptitude can be trained. You can improve your aptitude, but attitude is who you are. The person trying to influence or improve or change you cannot touch your attitude unless you want to. It's something that has to change from within you. So they ask questions to get a sense. You know, tell us about yourself. Are you prepared? You know, somebody say, tell us about it. They say, well, I came from a uh, so and so village in Imo State. Uh, you know, when you pass seven rivers and seven hills, and then uh, my father's family, we are the royal family, and we have uh, and the first of four children. <laughs> it happens. You know, some of you may think this is a joke. It's either you have done it. Or you have been an interview, and I have been an interview this year when this happened. Tell me a story about yourself, my dear. If you are listening to me, have your mean 30 seconds ready to use. What are your strengths? Does this person's experience, does he have the ability to meet our needs? Use a power statement. Pick a skill that's your strength, and use a power statement to express it. What's your strength? I'm, I'm very, I'm very hardworking. Um, you have just said nothing. Continue. I'm waiting for you to finish. I'm hardworking with the other items that make up a power statement. What are your weaknesses? This one is where most people just fall on their faces. They want to know whether you are honest. I want to know whether you are improving. So if you start trying to use a a strength as a weakness, they know you are lying. What's your, what's, tell us about your weakness. I, I, I work too long. I work too many hours. I don't have good work-life balance. Uh, so should we be impressed that this guy is a very hard worker? Uh, that's his weakness. <laughs> they know you are lying. Nobody, nobody buys that. Say a real weakness and use what we call turning negative to positive. A common weakness could be 
I, I, I sometimes I, I in, 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 in the pressure of uh, 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 the environment, I can be uh, harsh to my subordinates. It's a serious weakness. Some environments can't even cope with that. Express it further. I have, you know, uh, studied this. I have gone through this program. I have learned how to meditate and think about things. I have learned how to be proactive and remind and prompt to reduce the errors that leads to my uh, temperaments, uh, sometimes uh, letting loose. And in the last so so and so, uh, I've had so so and so pressured environments where I apply these new abilities and I was able to manage situation and I did not uh, 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 blow steam. I have, I have a real, this is a reality. Many employers will rather employ you for your honesty and make notes of that weakness so that they will see whether that um, improvement and change you have implemented is actually in so that they can help you to get better at it. What about what you think about your last boss? The last boss that you fought with and you, you didn't give notice and you walked away. And you come here and now start saying things about how the, that the environment is not very structured. Uh, the, there are no processes for doing anything. Uh, I had to leave because uh, you know the pressure was already too much. There were no other doing things. Just looking at it like this. Or the boss is always mean. He's always doing this and doing that to me. When you are done, just be going. Because <laughs> that boss you are describing that you have assessed to be negative is probably far better than all the bosses in this place you are coming into. And I know some employees who just have their heads in the sky, in the cloud. They've formed certain opinions about what the work environment should be, this utopian environment where everything is so seamless and process-driven. That if they don't see it, they want to leave. In certain markets, you can be leaving from one job to the other. But even that has its own risk. Yes. Because yes. if you leave one, leave two, leave three, the fourth, fifth, sixth guys you go to will start saying, this person is not reliable. We can't keep him. So you can't leave jobs. You have to show that you are respectful, that you can follow processes. How do you react to pressure? Does she take ownership? And so on. There, there are so many things, you know, that uh, goes into an interview. Bottom line here is you must be able to think through and use the right tools. Me in 30 seconds, answer with the question. That's why when you get to the uh, question, they say, do you have a question for me? Uh, uh, when they ask you, uh, how much do you want to be, uh, to be paid, for example, you can also answer with the question, uh, you know, is there a pay scale? You know, uh, you know, what do you have an offer for the role? I'll be happy to accept. You know, that some people will still drive you. No, we are not going to tell you. Tell us how much. Then give a range. That's the worst case scenario. Give a, a very wide range, right? Uh, but make sure that the bottom of that range is something you can live with. And if you do give a a range, and they hold on to the bottom of the range, for example, and they make you that offer. And you say, okay, it's fine. I'll, 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 you've reasoned it out that you can, you can cope with it and you accept it. And then when you now resume, you now find out that some subordinates and people at your level are earning twice that amount. If you get disgruntled, get dissatisfied, feel betrayed, you are foolish. Very foolish. Because at the time you reasoned your way into the job, you were happy with that offer. Do that job as if you are being paid the highest salary in the world. That's how you go over and above everyone else around you. Many of us are too selfish, self-centered, and greedy to the point where if we hear someone else is earning a naira more than us, we begin to equate the person's value in our own perception. How much work is that person even doing? How much he even comes late, for example? Oh, he doesn't even pitch in properly. Can I even talk well? Can I even write a number a email? Blah, blah, blah. You are criticizing the person, and yet he earns more than me. You begin to use that to affect yourself. Every time I speak to someone about um, 
unfortunate situations around being fired or being queried or you know uh, office politics you're losing out on office office politics the first thing i tell you is ask yourself what you need to do better don't always point your fingers at people because when you focus excessively on people you lose focus on yourself you don't get better again it follows you all through life when you become in an entity at some age, because at some age you are already wasted. And before the interview, we need to study the employer and go prepare to ask good questions. It's actually a problem of poor education. If somebody says, do you have a question and you don't have a question? <laughs> it's not only embarrassing, but it shows that you have not matured intellectually. How, why wouldn't you have a question? Why? You didn't do any preparatory work. You didn't, you didn't uh, do more research. Have you had people come to interview and I asked the person, what do we do? You apply to us as this, what is our business? I don't know. <laughs> the interview ends there. I don't even have one more minute to wait with you. Because you are the type that will come to my business and start waiting to be told, turn right, turn left. If I ever sleep, I didn't tell you to turn right when you arrive at work, you wait for me to come at 12 to tell me, to tell you to turn right, before you now turn right. I don't want that kind of employer around me. So you must have questions, you must have your mean 30 seconds, and have your past statements ready, yeah? So it's very important. There are so many questions you can ask um, when in an interview environment. Going for the interview, uh, prepare yourself, have, you know, work on your attitude, you know, pray for peace. And, and you yeah, know, I mean, all of us have some religious background or something that we, we, we anchor to spiritually. Uh, be polite and respectful, be on time. You don't have any reason under heaven to be late for an interview. No, not one. Oh, you no, know, this address was too hard to find. Uh, you know, we, oh, come on. If it meant going on that trip a day before, so that you can know the neighborhood and know how to maneuver your way before the day of the interview, do it. If you are so unable to use tools like Google Maps or other things to uh, ask questions to know your way around, so you can't be late. And by the way, traffic is not an excuse anymore in a city like Lagos. I was late because of traffic is the lamest thing you can ever say for any circumstance, not just for interviews, okay? Show interest in the company and the interviewer. Show interest, genuine interest. You come because you want to add something. Too many people go to interviews looking like I'm here to grab. Tell me what you have for me. Your entitlement mentality destroys the opportunity for you. Smile and be pleasant, act confidently and speak clearly. And then in terms of your grooming, clean and simple does it. Clean and simple does it. Any excessive anything from perfume that can be smelled from across the hallway to uh, nails that have been fixed to be uh, two inches out of your, your fingers to makeup that is Madonna or some uh, high class stuff already puts paints you in bad light. So is appearing shabby. Oh, I'm a very simple guy. Uh, I don't need to wash my shirts or iron it. <laughs> uh, yeah, people, I, I bathe once a day. It's in the evening. So even if I've not bathed now, my body will be a problem. There are so many things that can take you off. If I'm interviewing you, I cannot stand your presence. I end your interview and you're out. In fact, so many questions I will not even be asked because I can't stand your presence. It's disgusting. Okay. So for men and women, you know, moderate, simple, clean. And I dare say to men, please make sure, even men and women, everybody, make sure the clothes you wear to an interview is ironed. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be, um, uh, flat, uh, you know, uh, flamboyant. Don't borrow to, to go to the interview. Dress 
simple, but make sure it's higher. That's the simplest thing you can do, press it. And then uh, wear dress up one notch above the daily work routine. So if, if the job is a jeans and t-shirt kind of uh, a job, your interview, can, you can attend interview with a shirt and tie and a, a, a trouser, no tie, right? If it's a shirt and trouser and tie kind of job, you can put on a suit um, or a blazer. Just take it one notch up uh, for dressing. And then for women, please dress to look simple and corporate. At least let the dress go below your knee. All of those um, uh, um, uh, bump shorts and uh, mini skirts and uh, 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 cleavage revealing attires for interviews, my dear, it will only end you in another discussion, not that job. And then there are also application forms for many organizations, you know, before you, you come in for interviews, even they'll give you a form to fill, put in this, a bioeducation, your personal information, employment history, references, awards and recognitions. So there are some tips we also provided here. Um, use as much of the tools we've taught, uh, putting your, your skills using power statements uh, in any of these forms you are filling so that you can make the right impact as you submit those forms. Because some of them are just going to be the screening tool that is going to take you out or take you in um, to the job. Okay, I'm going to uh, take a five minute break. I'll be right back. Um, when I come back, I'm going to look at success on the job. And then I'm going to just scroll you through the uh, writing, uh, grammar, and all of those other things, uh, because they are very verbose and you should be able to read them up and understand them. But I'm trying to give you more of the life lessons in this section that we are discussing extensively, okay? So have a five minute break. We can hear. No audible. Like Hello. He's having, he's having a network issue. I think he's out. He will be back soon. He's working on it. Yeah. Let's continue with the class. <laughs> Which fit? Of course, fit. You can. Be you can. I, I just called Miss Barakat. So she said they are working on the connection. Okay, I was even trying to call Miss Barakat. I don't know yes, what I, happened. I, I just spoke. I just spoke with her now. Mm, okay, that's good. Okay. It's just I didn't see her on the group chat, like the chat list. And no, the, no, she's not. Poll, she's not so. even here. She's not here. Okay. But she'll be joining. Okay. Is that okay. Here now? How about Jackson? He's not also there. He's not here too. Okay. All right. I, I, I don't think the problem I had was necessarily uh, internet because uh, even after it, it knocked me off, I just couldn't sign back in with the internet, uh, even with a different internet. And now I'm still with the first internet. It just kept saying technical problems. So we're well, thank God I'm back in. Uh, let me share my screen and just uh, move on. That was a strange occurrence. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. All right, so how do you stay on the job? Um, when you start working, you don't just get lost into the job and not think about your future. Start building your own network, professional network. Be nice to people. Communicate clearly with others. Show good attitude and appearance. Uh, if you have a bad attitude, that, that job will not last because you are easily labeled and, and, and moved to one side. And before you know it, you're out. Work hard and prove value to your employer. When I say prove value to your employer, I'm talking of three specific things. Your employer needs increased revenue. 
your employer needs reduced costs and your employer needs happy customers. If anything you do does not add to one, two or three of these, it is not valuable to any employer. If you are not in a position to increase revenue, at least don't be the one helping to waste the revenue that has been generated. And if you can show value in any or all of these three areas, they should be documentable. You should be able to show value in terms of measurable metrics, things you contributed to the employer. And while you are doing that, you are planning your path to the top. I've seen people that have worked for 10 years, 15 years, they suddenly get dropped. And I don't even know where to start from. They start hearing things like, we have developed all my life. I, I, I don't know what to do again. It just dropped us and uh, life is not fair. You have not been fair to yourself. Nobody did it to you. And that's why many people are in jobs today that they cannot imagine losing. It's almost like I will die if I lose this job. So if somebody says, come and uh, uh, sleep with me as a woman or come and uh, steal on my behalf as a man or do some crazy thing, you will just say, I don't have a choice. I just have to do it because I don't want to lose my job. How many of you worship your job as if your life depends on it? It is because you are clueless about how to grow and how to get better jobs. Because you've not opened your mind to know how to deliver well to the point where you'll be desired to the extent that you'll be the one threatening, I want to leave. I don't say, no, 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 please don't leave. I beg not best, never is like that. I play with the play with you. How can you make this real in your own career? The moment you resume on one job, tell yourself how long you want to be in that position. One year, two years, three years. Which other position do you want to? Whether it's within the organization or it's in another organization, write it down the day you resumed. Not after you have buried your head in for 10 years. You suddenly just looked up one day and ah, it looks like this place is no longer good. The thing is coming to shake you after you have worshipped all kinds of demons to keep the job. It might not realize that ah, you need to start looking out. This is not about trying to jump from job to job. This is about doing the job that you have on hand as if it is the only job in the world, providing the value that makes you valued in that environment and building a portfolio that prepares you for your next job within or outside the organization when the right time comes. How many of you can have the confidence to walk out of a job because your moral compass does not allow you to do some things they want you to do. If you stay and do it, and you bend your doctor documents, you corruptly help people to get enriched, and you do all kinds of funny things on the job, just because if I resist, uh, my job will be on the line, they will fire me. It is because you're not prepared for the job market in the first place. It's because you don't have anything to, any value to give. That's why this job is so important that you have to sell your conscience to keep it. So the day you resumed, as you are doing it with all your heart, mind, mind, and strength, that's the day you are looking at what is the next stage for me? When will that next stage be? Three years time, two years time, three years time, five years time. You have to know. The skills and knowledge you will need and the reason you should know your next position now is because as you are working, you should be acquiring the skills and knowledge you need for that next position. It's not when you now get sacked after five, six, seven, or 10 years. You're not saying, please, oh, let me go and do one HSC course. Let me go and do one project management course. Let me so that I can use that one to, oh, come on. <laughs> In our careers class, I told you, if you, if you, don't, if you don't have a correct matching of education and experience. And experience, I told you again, not years on the job is value you've provided, right? You will not get any job. Don't think that 
Uh, you just quickly go and do one course, get one paper to, to apply for a job. That will give you the job. No, 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 no. It might, it might in some lucky stroke uh, situation. But there must be a matching between what you are doing, how you are getting the experience, and the training and growth you were giving yourself throughout that process. And I tell you, if you have spent five years since you graduated from school before you got another certification degree or something significant to add to your academic qualification, don't allow it be more than five years. So take it as my rule of five. My rule of number five. In five years after your first degree, acquire something else. A certification, most likely, because for FNs, additional degree. <laughs> because even your first degree in the first place has no value in your FN uh, profession in the first place. So having additional degrees, I don't know where, 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 where they're going to lead you to, right? But certifications, certificate programs, training that you can say, I went to learn this, I was tested and I passed and they gave me a certificate for this and that. It should be added regularly. But they cannot be added at random. I know people who, they will jump at every training opportunity. Ah, I know it, it's in myself. I want to learn tailoring and I want to learn uh, catering. And I want to learn uh, hairdressing. I want to learn coding. I want to learn the digital marketing. There must be a reason now you, if you don't have a reason, you are not coordinated. You are just jumping in all directions. Uh, people will do it like, uh, like um, hopefully, if one not work here, I don't know will work here. It's not a bad idea. I'm not condemning it altogether. But you must have reasons for everything you do. Do you know how you identify the patients you want? Somebody is in that position right now. And you think that job fits you. Then you ask yourself, how long did it take him to get there? Can I get it, you know, if it takes him 10 years, can I get it in eight or seven? What can I do? What did he do to get there? What can I also do to get there? What courses did he study? How can I study? So you investigate to know the things you need to. And then you must also start documenting the ways to gain those skills and knowledge, including how to save from today's resources to pay for those skills. Let me tell you. Very few organizations exist to keep training and certifying their staff. Most staff who know them, who knows their what's, who knows where they are going in life, they are the ones that feed themselves with training and certification, and they make progress. In many instances, after you've acquired a certification for yourself, the same company doesn't want to lose you, they will promote you. So even if you want to stay put, the positions you are looking for, you must target them well. And you must know how to gain the skills and knowledge. Don't hope that if you have spent 10 years here, they will not promote you into that position tomorrow because the company knows exactly what needs to be done there. And if you are not qualified for it, they will get somebody from outside that will be your bosses. And this is the problem many of us have in the FM industry. We are getting bosses being brought in when we could have been the ones stepping into those positions. Why? The money you have been saving are either going into consumption, paying medical bills and house rent and uh, 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 private school fees and things like that, instead of investing into your earning capability and capacity. And if people say, oh no, it's, it's my children's school first. So if I, just, if, I, if I can't pay my children's school fees and they are paying expensive school fees, my dear, you will end up plateaued, not able to make progress and what less eventually, those children will still suffer. So learn to save to invest. If your children have to go to private, uh, uh, public schools while you are still increasing your certifications, uh, because from 100K per month to 500K per month, if there are no mates when you come to annual salary, 100K per month is 1.2. 500K per month is 6 million. <laughs> so if you are taking 100K per month and you need to do school fees and house rent in a flat in, uh, in uh, somewhere and you are just keep spending because you are, you stay at a point and you'll be asked out. But the smart ones, they will live below 50% of what they are earning. They will spend the rest on acquiring and acquiring and acquiring in a focused way. By the time you are now, you know, at certain ages, 40, 45, you are not earning big. And you can move your children out of 
public schools and take them to, to private schools and private universities and you can give them the, the good things of life and you can begin to pay medical bills for everybody in your extended family. Not when you are still struggling or you are not standing yet. This is wisdom. If you want, take it, please take it. I'm not telling you not to be good to people, but run only as fast as your, your, your feet can carry you. Okay? And if you destroy yourself or die early, people you are still doing all those things, but they will move on. Don't think they will not move on. So that's how you grow on the job. And then don't stick with the same way things are done on the job forever. If you are on a job that uses one way of doing it today, keep your eyes open for news, technology, advancement, software, start getting involved, getting, becoming aware. The world now is a global village. Many of us have phones and we don't know what to search to go into YouTube for. We're only doing music videos and TikTok videos and celebrity gist and sports. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am not, I don't have a passion for any of those things. So if my friends even wonder how I, I survive without being a fan of a club or following football matches. I mean, you can watch it and tell me the score. I'll just follow. I can watch the summary of those highlights when they have finished playing it before and they are now doing it again. They're just fast, 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 fast. Hey, I like those ones because I have my faculty focused on more important things. So keep aware of technology. Be abreast, be a, 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 a ahead of the curve in your industry. Okay. All right, so uh, that's the segment I really want to emphasize on in this training. Um, uh, how to write, you know that uh, writing is what uh, moves you. It goes, your writing goes before you, right? So uh, whether it's reports, whether it's uh, emails, whether it's anything you, you, you have to write in the organization, uh, there are rules we've provided here because it shows professionalism. We are teaching a professional program and we cannot exclude uh, uh, important skills like how to write, how to present, and how to communicate. So you will need to read up all of this. I'm going to, uh, so many examples, uh, uh, even specific uh, lists and items were given in the material that you can use to organize your writing and do better. It's almost like, you know, if you remember Queen Premier of those days, it's almost like bringing back Queen Premier and uh, teaching you how to uh, put words together, okay? Uh, I'll go straight to this point about office emails. Uh, many of us use emails for everything. Proposals, memos, uh, warning letters, uh, whatever. Everything is just inside email. But try to understand that email belongs to the company. Say your official email. Many of you are even registering for private um, activities. You are, you are trying to get into something in YouTube, subscribe with your office email. You are trying to get into something in, uh, you are just using your office email to, to subscribe for everything, professional body registration, your office email. The day you are no longer working there, you don't longer have access to your email, so be careful. And everything that goes into your email is property of the organization, not yours. So it's not just enough to not own it, but remember that it will always stay forever. The data will never die. It will always be accessed when it needs to be accessed, okay? Um, but then when you send emails, don't use WhatsApp language or SMS language, okay? Let the wordings you use be spelled correctly the way you would normally uh, use them in a formal writing because that's what emails really are. Um, you know what the two CC and BCC, the, the CC is the carbon copy and the a blind uh, ca carbon copy. Uh, if you are, if you are, if you find yourself in an email where you were blind copied, it's because you they don't want you to see the other people's uh, emails. You, you shouldn't know all the others who were copied in the emails. If you want to reply to such an email, reply only to the to, not to the cc, because the cc does not know you were blind copied. So please manage that um, uh, process carefully. And then all of the other examples about writing, I'm just gonna talk about meetings and I'll be done with this class. And then you can start praying your questions.
because meetings are so important. Sometimes they waste they waste so much of organization's time. Have you ever found yourself in a meeting where you don't even know why you are there? You don't have a word to say. <laughs> you are not learning anything from them. You are just there <laughs> because of anything you should be there or because your title uh, was mentioned as listed uh, positions to be in that meeting. Uh, so before a meeting, you send out an invitation that tells people what um, uh, the meeting will be about, right? And that uh, is what we're talking about here. So the agenda of a meeting should be provided to people that will attend. And why do you need to do that? So that they can prepare and not come to waste everybody's time. You go into a meeting and get to somebody's turn and say, oh, please, wait, let me search for it now with all of us, all of our time. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know I was going to be presenting this. Uh, so please don't worry, next meeting. So we should all wait till next week. Before we so you, you can get a sense of what a meeting is. If you are attending a meeting that goes for one hour meeting, it's 10 hours of company time that has been, that has been used, right? So you must know why you're in a meeting and you must be prepared for the meeting, okay? And the agenda must be organized in a logical flow so that the discussions can, can be reasonable. And please set time for various discussions, guidelines for how discussions will be handled and don't allow any other business in your meeting agenda. I don't allow it. The best practice to say, if I'm sending you an invite for the meeting, this is the agenda discussion. If you have any other agenda you want us to discuss, please suggest it now so we can add it to the meeting and we share to everybody involved. Any other business usually gives the person who has any other business the advantage of being the only person that has processed the thoughts about that topic. And if that topic is allowed into a meeting, what happens is that the meeting minutes will read that we, we in the meeting uh, discussed and agreed what else is somebody's agenda. So that's why AOBs are not really uh, encouraged. Okay, so let's hear your questions. That's uh, everything else, please read up. Um, we have so many uh, courses you can take online from Max Migold. Uh, uh, online uh, uh, learning library, everything from uh, basic bookkeeping to Word, Excel, uh, 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 PowerPoint, uh, 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 how to use them, everything to leadership, everything to how to supervise people. We have about 150 um, uh, uh, courses online in our learning library that you can subscribe to, and they are not expensive. Each of these uh, courses are somewhere from uh, less than 10K, you know, just like your Coursera, uh, courses. Uh, we will we, we, we'll relaunch that platform and I'll start sharing it with you guys. So you can select uh, 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 setting of these uh, skills and be picking them one by one and getting certified, certified in them, okay? All right, so let's hear your questions. I'm going to... So please come back on your last statement. I didn't get you clearly. So. I said we have, a, we have a, an online library of soft skills um, that are cheap. 10K for uh, book basic bookkeeping, for example, supervision skills, uh, how to write business letters, uh, you know, proposals, specific skills that you need in the workplace. Uh, we will relaunch the platform. We, we've hosted it for almost four years uh, now in the Shopify platform, but we're creating a, a, a learning platform, a learning management system, like the one you're using for this class now. We're just going to load all of them in there and, and give you access to pick uh, uh, such short courses online, get certificates for them at 10K or less, things like that. Uh, because all of these things we are teaching in this program is uh, it's more condensed, it's more concentrated, but we try to highlight on the very um, significant uh, key ones so that you can have something you can get to work and start changing your, your way of doing things and the way of thinking right away. Uh, beyond that, you need them to keep studying and picking up more uh, expansion or expansion of most of these skills, okay? Uh, yes, thank you. you. Okay. Faith, your question. Okay, sir, my question is about um, CVs. You mentioned yes. that we should um, always, uh, we should re edit our CVs regularly. We shouldn't just wait till we are looking for a job. So my question now is, um, if, for example, my CV has been tailored to one particular um, scope, if I want to apply for a job, do I have to always edit it to suit that job? Yes, yes, yes. 
every time you you see when you if you are going to use me in 30 seconds for your introduction and you're going to use power statements for your skills and for every job your me in 30 seconds has an an, an element in it that has to be um, uh, suited to the job you're applying for and your past statements are supposed to be reflective of the skills that that job is asking for. So your CV must be written again and again and again. Okay, sir. So that means yeah. if, for example, I have several um, maybe certifications, I, I, that means I will need to apply only those that relate to the job, right? Yes, only those that are relevant the that to the job. Okay. Super, super. Only those that are relevant. Right, so not necessarily relate, but relevant because relevant. you could be going for an FM job. HSC is relevant. Yeah. Uh, project management is relevant. You understand? If you have done uh, environmental stuff, is relevant. If you've done community okay. health, is relevant. You get what I'm saying? Yes. It has sir. to be relevant to the job you're applying for. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Abdul. Yeah. Thank you very much. Today's um, course is quite. Uh, Enlighten. I think I got one or two things that I was that are personal to me. At a point in my organization, I was thinking I was putting in too much and I was not getting the right pay. But it just made me realize that I shouldn't look at that and also look at other bigger picture in future. Thank you for that. Fantastic. Another thing I want to say is, sir, yeah. I know you trying to help us think or um, operate in a global society. Mm -hmm. But some of the things you say are actually um, a little bit not suitable for our workplace here in Nigeria. Okay. Concerning the salary, you said someone said he has been working for uh, an organization for almost nine to 10 years, and the same thing. I have a friend in that same situation, and he's not that he's getting any extra pay. But what, 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 why is it there? Because of this suitability of the job. He actually fit into his lifestyle. It's easy to do other things at his own time. And, it was, and this company is a multinational. And this company is a and he has, they have not gotten a salary review in the last nine years. So what, what, what do you expect such person to do? Okay, so the, 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 the rate of such situation is if there are other people on that job who are being promoted and you are not being promoted, you are being seen as useless. You are valueless. You're back to that organization, and you could be fired. So, so he should not think of just hanging on to the job because it's suited to the, to the lifestyle. But he should think of how to be valuable to that employer on that job. The moment he becomes valuable to that employer on that job, the moment he becomes valuable. Why, why, why will he be in a job for for thirteen years, nine years, ten years, and no raise, no promotion, nothing? And then, and then you, you see, the truth is, you are being worthless to yourself and to the people you are around. Sir, one thing I noticed about him is that usually when they want to open new outlet or mm. new, they, they, they bring him into a, a committee or a group or a team mm. that they work on things and mm. they get it done. Later on, they return them back to their normal mm. department. So, mm. on that basis, I think it's been relevant, mm. but not. But no, there's no any additional. The only thing is they just add to their welfare for that period. After then, that's all. If he was fired from that job today, can he get employed by another organization in that industry? That's a bigger question. Because if you did not show growth where you are, the next employer will be skeptical about hiring you. That's my point. So even if you are comfortable, in fact, it's that comfort that is my problem with staying in one spot. If you are comfortable, move yourself to learn and add value in ways that you are recognized by your employer or by another employer elsewhere who will need you. If you are, if you are in a place where you are comfortable, you, you basically you rather like to ghost, uh, so that they won't notice you and give you more responsibility and give you promotion. Even when they ask you to promote you, you say, no, no, don't worry. I'm happy where I am. Just leave me uh, hiding here and ghosting. Come on. <laughs> that life eh, is a very painful life when things happen later. I see people who are dropped from jobs of 950,000 Naira. 
And for three years, they cannot get a matching job of 400K. Now, I mean, they can't even get half of the 950 they were making before. So they thought that they can just stay in that 950 forever and you know, don't just be enjoying the, the coziness. But the moment a dislocation happens, and then it now looks like, okay, let me go and look for another place like that. Everybody are looking at your value to your last employer. 9, 10, 15, 13 years, 13 years and you have not uh, uh, shown serious value, they will take you. The highest you'll be getting is half price negotiation here and there, just to manage you in another ghosting mode again. Don't put yourself in that situation, I beg you. It's not a useful place to be. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're wonderful. Yes, good evening, sir. Um, thank you for the wonderful lecture. This lecture has actually been very critical, like it started with it's a human um, relations kind of lecture and very critical to any career growth, actually. Sure. One thing that crossed my mind, you, when you were speaking about volunteering, it just came into my mind. Does it mean if you are in a job right now, you can't volunteer? Because I see facility management as part of my career goal anyway, is to graduate into project management on, you know, handling projects on my own, um, on my own. So I'm kind of like, I, that's just what's crossing my mind right now. I'm looking at jobs that are project management oriented that we include facility management at some point, but also other aspects of project management and maybe go to other industries and have elements of facility management. That's why I was just thinking about that volunteering aspect. Is it that right now I'm in a job, volunteering is zero, is out of it for me. Now, so, so the thing is, um, when you are in a job and you want to volunteer, most of the positions that are available for volunteers are also full-time. It's very, you get very few uh, uh, weekends and evenings kind of volunteering, right? Very few. The other volunteering opportunity you can, you can, you can use to practice volunteering now when you're in the job is to volunteer with your professional body. The three of facility management practitioners were having a conference seventh and eighth of, uh, of, uh, of uh, November at Civic Center. And we are looking for all kinds of volunteers to deliver letters, to uh, uh, call uh, sponsors up, to remind members to, 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 to register, pay the uh, fees and, and come in. There's a lot of work. Graphic designers are required. A lot of volunteering opportunities exist in the professional bodies that can help you manage. Take for example, you are in the committee organizing that conference. That's a huge project management uh, endeavor, right? That you can do on a part-time basis. But for most companies that you would want to volunteer for, they will, they will not be accepting you as a volunteer when you are working full-time with a competitor, for example, right? So that's the way to, to, to think about it. So if you get to a point where you want to make a clean break from one career to the other, then you can take a volunteer and internship opportunity to gain experience in that other field and stop from where you are. So that's why many people are coming to the FM diploma because they want to switch to FM. They will have to get to the point where they'll make a decision to stop uh, where they are and then decide to take up an opportunity um, that gives them experience within the FM space, okay? Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Adela, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir, for the lecture. Um, so I want to ask, I think more of, I need clarity on this FM career path. Um, I remember when we had the field trip um, experience, it was at a health facility. Mm -hmm. And um, at least from what I understood by all, all that we experienced, the facility manager there had to have a, a good understanding of how a health facility works for him to be mm -hmm. able to manage the place, yeah. Um, be, yeah, be useful. So 
is the facility management um, career, is it tailored to a sector? Like if you are growing your career, can you grow it to tailor it to a sector? Or there's just a general growth and then when you now find yourself in, in a particular industry, you now have to in, develop yourself for that industry. I don't know, but I just need clarity. What you said last is the correct statement. If you, if you, it's either you know exactly where you are going before, before you started, right? That you specifically look for work in that industry and you got in, or you just got any job. And while you are doing the job, you started improving yourself in that industry. Bottom line is you need to understand the organization you are working for, all their internal processes to be able to be, become the, strategic enabler you are now like the engine that makes that organization work well right so you cannot say you don't understand what they are doing and be able to enable them succeed at what they what they should be doing right so so that's why the fm's job we are we are masters of all right if i am in a transport organization today or an aviation organization today i am studying everything about the kind of customers I'm studying everything about the kind of 24 hour routines. I'm looking at uh, 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 aviation, uh, 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 statutory regulations that are specific to the aviation industry because my job is to understand all of those. So I'll spend time learning, getting certified in that industry to the point where when I write my uh, uh, main 30 seconds or any of my uh, power statements, they will be tailored to specializations in that industry. So I can actually grow in, there are FMs today that are just data centers. There are FMs today that are just hospitals and medical uh, facilities. There are FMs that are suited for malls and retail facilities. There are some that are factory and industries. You know, because you got an uh, opportunity and you now built yourself in it. The problem I'm trying to kill or uh, destroy right now from our minds is, that aloofness, if you work in a hospital for five, six, seven years, you don't get better at becoming a hospital manager. And then that job does no longer exist. You're not looking for work in a mall. And the person who is going to give you a mall is concerned that you've not managed a mall before. And while you're managing a hospital, you do not improve yourself to the point where another hospital will pick you immediately, you stop working in that last hospital. Then you have a problem. Okay. Okay, but then in that case, so shouldn't it mean that you shouldn't really be too streamlined? Because that's kind of like putting you in a box or something. No, no, see, get the point. Facility management eh, as a profession eh, is broad based. Okay. So FM manages built environment for every industry, every industry. If you have a CFM today, Certified facility manager. It means that you can operate in any industry at any level. That's what it means. But by the time you are building yourself up to that point, don't stop learning. Now you can keep learning and expanding your horizon in the broad way where you are acquiring the FMP, taking the uh, uh, IWFM training for more courses, but just keep building yourself. So streamline yourself to just hospitals is not my point. My point is don't stop learning. Don't stop improving. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Summer, last question for the evening. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Summer. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And good evening, sir. Thank you, sir, for today's lecture. <laughs> Every lecture we've been having has been um, quite expository and then um, knowledge based. Thank you very much. You're okay, sir. My question right now is this um, You said something about transcending from a particular position to another position, either in the organization you're working with or mm. in a different Out organization. Yes, yeah. yes. So the question now is. As an FM, if you're starting up as an FM in an organization, to so what level are you going to be transcending to? Are you going to be transcending to a director's level or probably uh, um, an assistant executive level? Or I don't know. So I'm just trying to look at the trend. Just what one level? step. 
one step yeah. above you, are, just one step above you at a time. If yeah. I start as a facility officer, the step above me is that of a, uh, a site manager. I really want to become a site manager. What would qualify me to be a site manager? That's what I'm working on. Okay, so, so can you just give us a little bit of the trend now? Let's see how the trend goes so that we can so, have a picture of how. Oh, yes, yes. So um, site manager. And then maybe the organization, because every organization has different nomenclatures. For some property development companies, they will have a property manager, they will have a, a contract manager, they will have a facility manager in the same high rise, for example. One is dealing with the contracts, one will dealing with the uh, leases and all of those uh, uh, user interface, and the other one is dealing with maintenance and operations that the FMs will typically live in such an environment, right? So if you are working for an organization that uses FM services directly, what we call a demand organization by ISO standard, the path is different from when you are working for a service providing organization. So if you are working for a facility management company, a cleaning company, a, a, a mechanical and a maintenance company, it, the path for service companies is different. Service companies staff can go from uh, cleaner to coordinator to supervisor of facilities to uh, cluster manager to facility manager to zona facility manager to area facility manager to uh, uh, director of uh, procurement or commercial to a managing director. You can go all the way to the top in any service company. But when you are working for a demand organization like a bank or an oil and gas company, you will be able to rise, but you will know that you will plateau at some point because unless the organization has um, uh, uh, such policy that allow people who are not in the core business to become the MDs, you may not become the MD, you may not even become an executive director, except in case of some banks where you have executive director of internal services or executive director of branch operation in the way branch business is core business. So they have different terminologies, but you should understand what the hierarchy is in the organization to know where you can rise to. So you begin to set goals for yourself on how long you should take from one level to the next. And if you put those plans in place, following the instructions and guidelines we have shared today, and you are probably not getting it because you are doing your best and it looks as if it's not giving you the results you want, then you can look out to those positions. Out. I have a friend that actually did that in a bank. He went to, a, he got to a point and he wanted a regional director's position. He knew it, it typically takes about 12 to 15 years in his bank to get to. So what he basically did was, at the point when he was a branch manager, he took a zonal manager's um, um, a role with another bank. He worked there for three years, and then he applied for a regional director's uh, position in his bank. So a, a, a post that should have taken him like 12 to 15 years to go from where he was, he got there in less than six, six or seven years because he used the strategy of, you know, doing three years here, moving out to go and do uh, two or three years and then coming back into his, uh, uh, his target uh, objective. But bottom line in all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is don't work as if you don't care about the future. Don't let the future happen to you. Let you be the one that happened to the future. Your future should be planned, should be focused, should be target driven. And target driven is not about writing position down, taking it to church to go and pray that God make me director, make me director. That's not what I'm talking about here. You need to know specifically what skills, education, experience, people who are there have acquired, how they got it. And you need to create your own plan on how you are going to be studying and acquiring it so that someday, faster than they did, you will be there. So Samuel, one step at a time and not, uh, not necessarily trying to uh, uh, go from uh, FM officer to executive director, no. One step, once I'm in site manager, I plan for uh, cluster manager. Once I'm in cluster manager, I plan for regional manager. Once I'm in regional manager, I plan for executive director like that, yeah? So another question is this. 
Okay. I'm sorry. So another question is this: um, can, can this be possible if we are not narrow, narrow-minded to a particular sector, or if we are vast I mean, as, in, as an FM, being a practitioner in virtually any sector we find ourselves? Can this FM, be possible? FM, to... Yes, yes. FM is a jack of all trades and master of all, right? So let me give you let me give you a a, a, a simple pathway in FMS passes, right? You 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 can you can gain your all FM certification are not sector specific, none. Whether it's the FMP, the SFP, the CFM, none of them is sector specific, because an FM provides services to all industry. So you can actually rise within FM, right? Without being narrowed down to one sector, you can, and I want you to actually take that path. Okay, so don't think that because you are in aviation today, um, you go and start doing aviation related stuff that you did not grow in FM. If you are doing FM and you are studying avionics and all of those technical stuff in aviation uh, 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 business, uh, that is because you want to leave FM. Your next job is inside aviation. But if you want to be FM, you should be studying FM and, and working your way up in FM, okay? Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Looks like Abdul and Diola are back again. Okay, Abdul, quick one, 30 seconds. Okay, sir. Um, you earlier mentioned well, during your presentation that um, when you're writing your CV, you should probably mention the organization you would like to be. You mentioned Church Kid. Okay, now what if George Gates do no, not have facility no, manager? No, no, no. Because I am sending my CV to Church Gates, I can say I want to work in Church Gates. I cannot be writing my CV for another person and be writing. If if there is no opportunity there, I won't be applying in the first place. If I'm even shooting a if I'm even shooting a wild dart towards Church Gates, for example. Uh, if they see the value, because I, before I even do that for a vacancy that was not declared, either I know somebody or I know the business enough to see that their facility management is in disarray, and there's the way I will package myself and they will see me as the savior and they will invite me. I get what I'm saying. So yeah. it's possible that they've not published a vacancy, but I've studied them enough to know that this people have problem. I need to find a way to get in there and add value and solve their problem. I'm packaging myself for them specifically. Okay, now, so what about banks that outsource their facility management roles? And mm -hmm. you would like to work with that bank, but you don't know the facility managing uh, managing company that they actually uh, um, hired, or you will know, but the company is not willing to send you to that sector. So wanting no. to send, send you to another sector, maybe they have a factory somewhere, or they have a manufacturing company somewhere, or they have a sports center somewhere. So or a medical center. There are two different somewhere. companies. There are two different companies. The okay. bank is a company on its own. The yeah. source FM company is a company on its own. Who do you want to work yeah. for? Choose. If you want to the work bank. for the FM company, <laughs> it's different for you want to for the, If you want to work for the bank, you apply to the bank to become their facility manager who will now be on supervising that contractor. Okay. So, so, so the bank that has sourced their FM is looking for a strategist. So you must investigate them and see exactly where you should pitch to be a solution provider so that they can employ you to go ahead and manage that contractor. But sometimes they don't come as, those jobs don't come as FM. Sometimes they as operational managers or admin or sometimes, sometimes admin, you know, package it's okay. in such it's manner. Okay. It's okay, you know it, you know it. So because you know it, you 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 refine your 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 pitch and your submission to reflect what you know is the need and the nomenclature there. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right, Diala, you're welcome. Okay, quickly. Um, I think I'm not sure, but I think um, this course there's supposed to be like a is there an internship. Um arrangement or offer or something so so what we have on the on the fm diploma is everybody that is not working and willing to sign up for the internship program will 
sent, we'll look for three organizations and sent to the training department where letters will be prepared and given to you to take to those organizations. And we will also create your profile and send to our network of 800 companies, right? And there's a high likelihood that within a month, you'll be invited for several interviews mm -hmm. for internship. But you are not working. That's the first uh, uh, criteria. Yeah. And two, you are ready to work as an intern because we've had issues where people go for internship interviews and start negotiating salaries. Internship is not for, it's not a paid job. So, <laughs> so I, I found this out after uh, having uh, somebody who had gone for five, six interviews uh, organized by, by my office wasn't getting picked. I got curious because it never used to happen like that. We're not, you can't go to two, three interviews after all this training we provided for you and not be a preferred candidate. In fact, many of them, if you go for internship and they realize that you are that good, they will say, you know what, we are placing you on a salary. In fact, there was a guy in 2018, he went for an internship interview and they say, you know what, you are better than even people who are paying 80K. We're going to pay you 80K. You understand? So that's how he entered internship and he was earning. But he knew that 80K was not the salary he's looking for. So he accepted it for the internship period. When it was six months, he said, my internship is over. Are you guys going to discuss salary now or I should look for work elsewhere? You understand? And then he moved on with his career. Okay? So, so but many of them will go there and they start saying, ah, this, uh, uh, your, in fact, there was a lady that was placed in a, in a role in first half and uh, they said they'll be giving her 20K transfer allowance. And then she stopped coming to work after about two weeks. And they called her, what happened? You didn't come to work for, to work for three days. You see, the transfer allowance is finished. Wow. <laughs> and I said, how far can you burn our reputation for giving you such a placement? It was terrible. We, we have had very terrible experiences. But so we teach people, anybody coming for the internship should see their training as an extended period. If you're able to feed yourself and transport yourself during the three months, extend it to be nine months because the internship is going to be a six month period where you don't expect any money and wherever you are placed, you are going to work and you're going to work as if you are earning millions so that in six months, you're not coming out with, I work for six months, you're coming out with, I achieved this, I achieved that, I achieved that. Six months experience can move you from uh, uh, an internship that pays no money to a 500K job. And that's the truth. So that's what we, 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 we are doing here. We'll definitely give you internship opportunities, but it has to be, in fact, there was one lady that said she wanted internship opportunities. And, and then when I sent her one, two, three, she came, she came one day and said that uh, internship opportunity, they, they, what did I even offer? Can I even afford my car? I didn't even know she had a car. I said, you have a car, what are you looking for internship for? Just apply for the full-time job because once you are done with this training, apply for work as an FM. In fact, not even be done. Somebody in our 2017 set got a job as a group FM head for a merchant bank covering 13 branches, 13 buildings across the country. Why she was just in her, she had attended just two months of, of classes. So, so the way you reason, the way you think, the way you package yourself is already superior to most candidates that you will encounter on the interview front. So why lying about wanting an internship when it's a real job that you want that to pay you well? Eventually, that same lady that said she wanted an internship rejected a 350K job. I had to scramble to get somebody else from my class to, to grab that job before it goes to uh, a, 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 a non citizen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, maybe I will have to ask because I think I have a maybe a personal different angle. Maybe I'll have to talk to you outside the class yes, so that please, I don't drag the class. Please, 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 never okay. no highlight. Thank, Thank you, you so much, guys. Um, have a nice evening. We'll meet again on Monday. I'm sure I'm the one teaching on Monday. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Yes, uh, uh, it's really. Uh... <laughs> uh...